consequences of our biases, um, or how they might be different for different classes of algorithms. So, a, a very uh, quick overview and to see things. Okay. So, models in ecology. We have two different I mean, um, two different variables that you have some sort of association. Sometimes you form the model. This is body size and temperature, right? So not what we're usually doing, but just to think about it. Um, maybe in this species, higher temperatures lead to larger body sizes. So you have uh, some sort of a regression that shows this association, right? Um, and you can then parameterize that. So we're doing something kind of like that, but our relationship is between predictor variables and suitability. So this is um, an example uh, for uh, for Spain, and then uh, she took that and then uh, applied it to estimates of what the body size would be. This is a made-up example, um, but this is an analogy of the kind of thing that we can do. But here. We have we have this real kind of strange issue of having positive data but not negative data. And what we're interested in, I mean, we see relationships here uh, between different variables, temperature and precipitation. And what we want is another variable that comes out of the screen, which is suitability, right? Or we show this different color or something like that. Another situation is where we have the presences. But we also have absences. So we can we have two sets of data that we can contrast and pull apart. And then sometimes we have our presence data, and we don't have good information about absences, but we can get a sample of what's available in our study region. So we can still do a contrast, but instead of pulling apart the presence, the, the environment for the presences and the absences, what we're really trying to do is say what is special when we pull up the, the presences compared to everything that's available. So the different classes of models to some degree correspond to the kind of occurrence data that we have in our particular study region. Just presences, where we kind of make a profile of the environment. Presences versus absences, where we are trying to see what's different between those two classes, which hopefully we don't overlap very much. And presence and background, where we see what's available, and then we see what's special about the places where the species actually occur. All of this based on the environmental variables that, that we think are reasonable to try. So, some classes that only use presences, they really only use information for presences. Bioclim, which we all know and love, Domain, um, uh, multivariate uh, distance algorithms like Polonova. Some techniques that are set up to do presence absence uh, comparisons uh, are a lot of regression type techniques, GLM, JM, and uh, boosted regression trees, uh, which are kind of hard to use, but they perform very well. These also can be used with presences and to absences, or even with presences and background data. Um, people have done that. Um, but they're really designed for this classification procedure of um, or figuring out what's different for between positives and negatives. Right? Um, and I will get uh, a little more on two absences in a minute. But some are, are really set up from the beginning to compare presences to what's available. Map is set up that way, and there's also resource selection functions as well as ecology do this. Um, it's, it's been really exciting the last couple of years to see um, statistical and uh, equivalency between MAXIN and some other things, such as, for example, a particular kind of point process model. Um, so the, the field is really um, moving forward as biologists and statisticians you know, are really communicating. But let me say one thing about background data versus pseudo absences. So, an absence is really hard to know, right? Because it might be there and you can't, uh, you can't detect it, or it might have been there yesterday and it's not there today, all of those kind of issues. 
Um, so absence data are very hard, right? Some people have used pseudo absence uh, as an exact synonym of background data, of just a random sample of our study region that we're going to compare that to our presence data. Okay? Um, other people use pseudo absence in a different way, where they talk about places that have been sampled, but we did collect a C sheet, right? But we're not certain that it's not there. The sample wasn't sufficient for us to want to call it an absence. But we want to call it, you know, a pseudo absence. We're not sure it's an absence, but you know, our data so far, we have some data and they are towards the absence side. And some people just don't like the kind of background, they just want to call if, even if it's a random sample of what's available, they want to call it a pseudo absence, right? And in general, um, that's going to be pretty similar to, I mean, a pseudo absence sample of places that have been sampled. Um, it's going to be pretty similar to background, but it depends on how intensive your sampling is across across your study region. If you have only gone, uh, you know, a few places, if you are um, random, you're taking a, um, you don't have a very big presence sample, right? And you have this random sample of places that have been sampled. Um, it's probably not very different from a totally random background. Uh, but if you have a situation where you've had a whole lot of sampling all across your study region, the dip, there may be a large difference between uh, the random sample versus just the areas where you don't have a presence. So those actually could be quite different. So pulling apart the two can be quite different than pulling out what's special about what's available. But this is supposed to be about model. So imagine um, we have these two. You can do uh, just with preferences a very simple uh, profile technique like BioClim, and we'll do some of these. So this was what Hutchinson imagined for two dimensions, right? Um, the main look at the distance. Uh, from the multivariate uh, centroid of this, so this is Mah I'm sorry, Mahalo and the uh, This is the multivariate phase. This is an example with a particular plant from Spain. These are presences. This is a model from Bioclim. This is a model from Domain, which is very different. <coughs> and this is the model uh, using the Mahalo system. So three different answers, the same data, that's same environmental data, same appearance data. Okay? So why are they so different? This is scary, right? Um, so first of all, the, the scaling of the output is different. They're modeling different things. I mean, they're modeling the distances versus, I mean, they're just not modeling the same thing. And the output from zero to one is not the same, so the color gradient is different too. Um, then moving on to presences and absences. So this this is kind of uh, we have to say that this is what we really want is something coming out of the um, out of the screen or showing color to show you the relationship. Um, but she's trying to show that uh, a linear relationship between two variables. What we really want is between one and suitability, or one and um, something coming out of the screen. But um, a GLM would be something linear, where um, if you allow the distance direction, it could be a, a different shape. Whereas with the GAM, it can be much more complicated. But when it's more complicated, it's more prone to what? To overfitting, right? Okay, and you can overfit to two different things. Any ideas? What might you overfit to? So here, if our real relationship were something, we're not modeling suitability here, we're modeling the relationship between temperature and precipitation. If this is the real relationship, right, then if we go here, these extra details, what is that? Yeah, and to noise in our sample, right? So you can overfit to noise. What else can you overfit to?
So we've talked about problems with our data, right? Our occurrence data. So one can be, you know, just random differences, uh, you know, random differences among sites and the particular ones we have. So that's what we refer to as noise. What other problems have we talked about with occurrence data? Yes. So if your occurrence data are biased in geographic space, you're likely to be just biased in environmental space. Mm -hmm. If so, you can overfit to a bias. And when we get to evaluation, especially tomorrow, the kinds of evaluations we want to do before we project or transfer, we're going to see different strategies for detecting overfitting to noise and strategies for detecting overfitting to a bias. Okay? Okay. Um, regression trees are very different on uh, how they work. You can read about those. Um, and cards at the time of regression tree and a series of decisions. I think these are very interesting. I think they might be very good in dealing with interactions uh, between variables. That booster regression trees especially have been very um, very successful. And here are some examples of these presence absence or presence pseudo absence. So here's the GLM, here's the GAM, here's the regression, uh, here's the regression tree. So they, they also are different. Um, and then now let's think a little bit different, at least in, um, in intent, is presence compared to available, presence compared to background. Where you don't have this neat separation between the red and the blue, you have all of these areas are available, but yet these are the only ones that are occupied. So it's trying to say, out of the reds, what is special about the blues? And so MapSense is one example of that. But like I said, many of these can also be run with true background data. Um, so MaxSense can do a lot of things. It has a lot of flexibility in the shape of the response curve um, to any individual variable. It also um, can consider um, interactions between pairs of variables. And here's uh, a MaxSense output. And there's a lot of controversy right now about this different ways to scale the output of the MaxSense um, uh, prediction. And we can talk about some of those papers uh, if you want to. So, for some ways that many models exist, and you have to think about what you want to do, and use a model that matches your question. Um, the recommendation is you start with something very simple and intuitive, like Biosun, and maybe Maxent because it's uh, that's performed well and it's easy to use. Um, but with Maxent, it's very, very important to use this sheet of model complexity because you can get a very complex model. Uh, if you if you put in a lot of variables, especially if you have a lot of standards that allow you to make a very complex model, so it's very prone to um, to models that are likely to be overfit to uh, noise in your data uh, and in the bias. And how many of us are happy that uh, we have no bias in our current records? How many of us are worried that we might have bias? Okay. Um, so, there's also the approach of an ensemble forecast or an ensemble model. Would anyone like to give some of the ideas of why that could be helpful? Those are even kind of more 
similar. Imagine if you compare those with the domain. Yeah. Okay. The, the color included in the final assembly, the C value, what the memory, all of the formulas, and the, you, you exclude them, right? Yeah. Okay, so is that a pro or a con? In one paper you the same author criticizes the method and the other he uses the method to to so it's something the same author, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's very complicated sometimes. Yeah. yeah, so so one thing is are the techniques is there a majority of the techniques that are giving a similar answer? You know? And one question is, you know, if you have five different regression-based techniques and one machine learning technique and two profile techniques, you know, should they be weighted equally, all of them? You know, or do you try to look at performance of each and weight according to performance? Or weight by performance by throwing out just the, the ones that are not performing well and then equally weight the predictions of the other? Scaling. So some, so some people have philosophical uh, questions about the idea of ensemble forecasting. Others just have questions about, you know, in reality, how should you do this, right? Um, so it's certainly an open, an open area. And one thing I would add to the table is, if you are trying to decide which particular ones to use, either to throw some out or to weight them according to their performance. Then I think you have to be very careful about how you assess performance. Um, and we're going to see um, some today and some tomorrow that um, many people are uh, assessing performance using data that are not independent of their training data. And I think that's likely to reward techniques that are overfitting to, um, to biases in your collection sample. Um, so, and then we have the issue of the particular measure that we use. Are you using uh, emission rates? Are you using AUC? Are you using PSF? You know, what are any other biases in those techniques of tending to reward complex models or tending to reward uh, models that are, that are simple? So we're going to get into a little of that. And most of those problems come down to the fact that our presences, we hope, are really, really good. But there's a lot of reasons that our comparison data might not be right. Either our absence data, or our student absence data, or our background data. And because of this, then the, what we call an omission error and a commission error, they don't really have the same weight. Or if you heard sensitivity and specificity, um, then it's, it's not realistic to weight those equally. So we'll get into that in the evaluation part. So here is an ensemble sheet case of neural networks and a social regression model with Dan and Flynn. And so she's thank you. <laughs> Obrigado. And she's no picture of her this time. So, so uh, just a few minutes for questions. Yeah. Um, so.